the Alps, from Slovenia to Switzerland, a journey across Europe's most prominent mountain range. Hochjoch Glacier separates Tyrol from South Tyrol. A glaciologist studies the climate changes in this world of ice. From afar, South Tyrol's vineyards come into sight. The wine from Lake Kaltan is sold all over the world. Some farms are so high up in the mountains that they've only been accessible by road for a few years. South Tyrol and Trentino are the most northern provinces of Italy. The journey leads from Val Venosta, north of Bolzano, over the Dolomites in the east. From here, the route leads to Lake Garda in the south. On the south side of the Alps, in the tri-border region of Austria, Italy and Switzerland, lies the Ortler mountain range. At just under 4,000 meters, Ortler is the highest mountain in South Tyrol. On clear days, you can see as far as the Bernese Alps, almost 200 kilometers away. The northwest flank of the Ortler is capped by a 70-meter thick sheet of ice and snow. This surface makes it easier to cross than some of the other mountains. Not far away, one of the highest pass roads in the Alps winds its way across Stelvio Pass and down to the alpine pastures of Val Venosta. Near Lars lies Turkov Farm, at an altitude of 1100 meters. Here the slopes are so steep and the areas are so small that the farmers can only work their land by hand. During harvest they need help, but most of them can't afford to hire farmhands. Luckily there are people like Astrid Jung. Astrid is a nurse. While other people spend their holidays lying on the beach, she helps out on the farm in the Alps for three weeks. I like people and I like to help them if I can. If there's something I can do to help, then I think it's a good way to spend my free time or holidays. When I come here, usually in mid-August, it's time for the second hay harvest. So I start by helping out with that. This year we were lucky. It only took a week, as the weather has been great. It was hard work, but we managed it. It is Astrid Jung's third summer here. She found out about it through an article about the association that organizes voluntary farm work. Now she's become part of the family. I'm lucky that this fell into my lap. I get to experience daily life in a very special way. <laughs> In the mountains, it's still common for three generations to live under one roof. But agriculture isn't profitable enough to feed the family. 
Mahzeit. 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 Farmer Rosvita still works on her parents' farm. Her husband Elmar has a job in town to earn some extra money. To keep the farm going, Rosvita has ventured into uncharted territory and set up a raspberry plantation. South Tyrol is one of the most beautiful orchards in Europe, but raspberries are unusual at such an altitude. After the harvest in summer, the plantation has to be cut back so that the young buds get enough light and grow again the following year. With an area of 2,000 square meters, harvesting takes two whole weeks. But Astrid enjoys the work. I prefer working outside, and if you look at the surroundings here, it's just paradise. I'm from Cologne in Germany and work as a nurse in the operating theatre, so I'm inside all day long without daylight. As it was my own choice to come here, I enjoy the work and don't find it hard. The first week is a bit difficult, as you can feel it in your feet and legs, but it's still fun. to Tirolo, the journey leads over the snow-capped peaks and glaciers. Lars is known for its white marble. This quarry is one of the few where marble is cut out of the mountain. The individual blocks weigh up to 8,000 tons. Even in the ancient world, marble from Val Venosta was used for the milestones along the Via Claudia Augusta that connected southern Germany to northern Italy. Today, Lars exports its marble to the whole world. It's also being used at Ground Zero in New York. And even in the local cemetery, white marble abounds. Every gravestone was made by a local sculptor. Hochjoch Glacier on the Austrian border. A few decades ago, a large ice field still covered one large area. Due to global warming, only some smaller glacial snouts remain. In addition to the polar ice caps, glaciers are the largest freshwater reservoirs of the Earth. Their disappearance has greatly changed the face of the Alps and contributes to the rising of the sea levels. In the 1890s, the University of Innsbruck was one of the first in the Alpine region to conduct a long-term study of the glaciers. To allow conclusions about any changes, the data has to be collected over decades. Glaciologist Andrea Fischer is currently responsible for the recording of new figures. She's constantly overwhelmed by the beauty of her object of study. Glaciers are my workplace. I often go up and drill to take samples. When you go up there, you hear all kinds of sounds, and the ice is often very bright. It almost glistens. It's an incredible sight and awe-inspiring. You know that this ice is centuries old, and sometimes even older than that. It has been lying up there for an incredibly long time. It moves slowly and cracks. It's always a beautiful sight to behold. In spite of the danger, Andrea Fischer is on the glacier all by herself. 
Of course, there are some things that are dangerous, like the crevasses that open due to the glacier's movement. The glacier is actually being torn apart. The crevasses can be very deep or filled with water. There are rock falls and also glacial mills. Sometimes the flowing water makes a hole and you certainly don't want to fall into one of those. But we're experienced and have been trained well. You have to be fit as it's quite a journey up there. Every day I walk for about 16 hours and can be carrying up to 30, 40 kilos. That's hard physical work. The art is still being able to think in spite of it. On her tours, she often spends the night in refuge huts or bivouacs, right in the middle of the ice. Every summer, Andrea Fischer goes to the glacier and every year it looks different. After a snowy winter, it can have grown, for example. Andrea Fisher hardly takes any personal belongings with her. The bulk of her luggage consists of her equipment, like the gas burner which creates hot steam to get through the ice. With her measurements, the glaciologist can determine if the ice field has lost a larger proportion than normal over the past year. Some of the timescales we have are amongst the longest in the world. And that's why the data we collect is so important for the international climate research. But it is hard work. The hot steam eats 10 meters deep into the ice. On the glacier, measurements are taken with simple wooden rods. When I put the rod in there, it freezes. And when you go there the next time, it will be just under a meter above the ice. In two weeks, it will stick out about two meters forty, and so on. If you go up there at the end of September, you can see how much has melted that year. Thank God the glaciers melt. Otherwise, they would already have ended up in Hamburg in northern Germany. But at the moment, they melt a lot. Only a little snow that can turn into ice remains. And that's why the glaciers are receding. It's quite prominent, as we have lost almost half of the ice since the end of the last little ice age in 1850. Despite the snowy winters, over the last 150 years, the glacier has been receding by about 40 meters a year. If it continues at this rate, it will soon disappear or turn into a miniature glacier. There will always be areas of shade where avalanche snow will collect and there the glaciers will remain for a very, very long time. Soon, images like this may only exist in archives. The journey continues into the Etch Valley. Here the climate is mild and humid. Valleys like these form the largest fruit-growing areas in Europe. Every tenth apple eaten in Europe comes from South Tyrol. Tyrol Castle towers high above Mirano Valley. 
It used to be the ancestral seat of the Counts of Tyrol, after which the region was named. Up until the 14th century, Tyrol's sovereigns lived here, before they moved their residence to Innsbruck. trees and wine grow in the valley. A few hundred meters higher up, the terrain is rough and dangerous. Although landslides are a constant threat, people continue to live here. In August 2011, this farm above Parchin's village, north of Mirano, was nearly hit. A landslide 50 meters across plunged into the valley on a length of 1,500 meters. And spared the farm, a miracle. The night before, there had already been a few rockfalls and the population had been evacuated. The landslide ended in a vineyard. These houses have only been accessible by road for a few years. In the valley, the climate is favorable to fruit cultivation, whereas animals are kept in the mountains. Marian Tartarotti comes up here every few weeks. I'm a vet for large animals. I treat cattle, goats, sheep, pigs, and sometimes other animals. Like these animals from the Andes, llamas. For the farmers, these animals are a hobby, as they don't provide milk and aren't very profitable. And for Marian Tartarotti, they make a change to her work routine. The difference is probably that here vets aren't used to llamas. Thankfully, they are very robust, so they don't need to be treated often. You rarely see a sick llama. Marian studied veterinary medicine in Vienna and then returned to her hometown in South Tyrol. Together with her husband, she opened a surgery in the country. As part of the preventative medical treatment I provide, I take blood samples from the llamas. I thought it would be like taking blood from a sheep or a goat, but it doesn't work like that. I had to look up in a book where exactly to take blood. Their skin is very thick and you have to prick them quite hard. I already managed to get some blood the first time and from then on I was a llama expert for the farmer. Today, Marion is dosing the llamas for worms as a preventive measure. Her next patient is already waiting. The vet drives around 100 kilometers each day and is on call 24 hours a day. This cow also needs the vet. It has a fever and is refusing to eat. As the dairy industry is the main income for the farmers in the region, Marion also examines the concentration of cells in the cow's milk, which will be higher if the udders are infected. The test shows no clotting of the milk, all is well.
The next leg of the journey leads into the Pusta Valley, headed for Falces. On the way lies Mirano. This is where tourism first started in South Tyrol in the 19th century. 300 days of sun a year and the mild climate also drew Empress Elizabeth of Austria to the spa town. The Pusta Valley is climatically different from Val Venosta. Here neither wine nor fruit grow. The South Tyrolean part of the Pusta Valley is called the Green Valley, but its lush appearance is misleading. Even the settlements are located at an altitude of a thousand meters. The valley isn't typical for South Tyrol, as it doesn't open out to the south like the other valleys do. Only hardy plants grow here. Brigitte Niederkofler's herb garden is situated on a sunny high plateau 850 meters above sea level. At the end of June, the marigolds are in bloom and can be harvested. Since 1912, the Niederkofler family have produced essential oils and medicinal herbs. She is the third generation. I'm fascinated by the fact that these flowers don't need to be thrown away. They don't end up on the compost, but they have medicinal properties and can be processed further. As early as the 12th century, Hildegard von Bingen was convinced of the healing powers of marigolds. Only the blossoms are picked, as they contain the medicinal substances. Marigolds are mainly used for inflammations, in form of oil and as an ointment. It's a wonderful medicine against burns, injuries and inflammations of the skin. But you can also use them in tea, as they act as an anti-inflammatory for the internal organs. After they've been picked, the blossoms are put into the drying cabinet, which is more effective than drying them in the open air. They're placed on a grate and are dried at 35 degrees, like in an oven. If you do that at home, then you should never dry the plants in the sun, as then many of their active agents are lost. That's why it's best to lie them in the shade and to either hang them out to dry or lie them flat and wait until they are really dried out. Brigitte married into one of the most traditional essential oil distilleries in South Tyrol. Her husband is responsible for producing the oil. It's hard work that you have to do in the forest, and it all has to be chopped by hand, so it's almost impossible for a woman because it requires a lot of strength. The oil of the mountain pine is in the needles. Before distilling, the branches are chopped into smaller pieces. To extract the oil, the pine needles and other medicinal plants are distilled according to traditional methods. The nice thing about working with nature is that we're able to work in a sustainable way and ecologically. We don't produce any waste, and that way everything maintains a natural cycle. I enjoy mixing things together working with fragrances and putting them together. The Niederkofler family get the raw material for their oil from the high plateaus around the Pusta Valley and Isaac Valley. If the mountain pines weren't cut down, the alpine pastures would soon be overgrown.
From Faltz's, the journey continues southwards. On the way to Termeno lies Val Badia, a valley carved deep into the Dolomites. The Dolomites are refuge to many animal species. They bring up their young far away from the hiking trails. The summits of the pale mountains can be seen from afar. Many of them are over 3,000 meters high. The Dolomites gained their characteristic shapes due to the weathering of their carbonate rock. In 2009, this rocky landscape was declared a UNESCO World Natural Heritage Site. In the valleys, people live an isolated life. For this reason, an old Rato Romance language could be preserved that's only spoken by around 30,000 people, Ladin. As in Laval village. This is where the members of the music group Garnis come from. Ladin is our mother tongue. Until we went to school, that's all we could speak. That's why it's also the language we think and dream in. And it's the first language that comes to us when we write songs. It's actually well suited for music, as it sounds so soft. There are a few songs that we wrote here. When we finish our tours, we always come back home for a while. Then we have the time and motivation to be inspired to do something new. Ladin is now only spoken in northern Italy and in Switzerland. Like Reto Romance, it's a relic of so-called Vulgar Latin, the predecessor of the Roman languages. <laughs> Even if the lyrics are in Latin, the audience usually understands what the songs are about. They understand the emotion. And when you see how open the audience is and how well the songs are received, you go home with a smile on your face. And that's wonderful. The musicians, two sisters and their cousin, have been playing music together since they were children. Now they live in Salzburg and Munich. We write some of the songs together, and all three of us sit down, take out the guitar, cook something together and try to write. Most of the ballads are written by each of us individually, mostly inspired by an emotion or something we want to express in music.
From Valbadia and the Ganes, the journey continues via Bolzano to Termenu on Lake Calton. On the high plateau of Montepiana, trenches, tunnels and bomb craters testify to the Tyrolean mountain front that passed through here. Mindless static warfare was waged all across the places that mountaineers consider the most beautiful in the Alps. For over 20 months, Italians and Austrians fought at an altitude of 2,000 meters. The difficulty of delivering supplies brought destitution. More soldiers died of cold or starvation than through enemy fire. Tens of thousands were killed by avalanches. Many mountains were tunneled into. In a hundred years, hardly any plants have grown back. Today, mountaineers make use of the war relics in the Dolomites. Many fixed rope routes were put up by soldiers. One of the most famous leads onto the peak Piskjadu. Here, an eight meter long rope bridge spans a deep precipice. Framed by the Dolomites and the vineyards lies South Tyrol's capital, Bolzano. Until today, it's the only town in South Tyrol where more Italian is spoken than German. Mussolini resettled thousands of laborers here from the south during the Second World War. Earth pyramids in Ritten near Bolzano were created by erosion of an Ice Age clay field. The stone on the tip protects the clay pin underneath from water like an umbrella and keeps it hard. That way it defies erosion. Around Lake Kaltan, the climate becomes milder. The warm air current from the south during the day and the cold nights provide ideal conditions for wine growing. For a long time, Lake Kaltan was the synonym for mass-produced wine. Meanwhile, the yield has been reduced to a third in favor of the quality. And as well as local grapes like Tramina or Venache, classical grape varieties like Chardonnay, Cabernet Sauvignon or Merlot also grow in South Tyrol's largest wine-growing region. Castel Ringberg Vineyard is run by one of the few female winemakers in South Tyrol, Elena Walch. It was established in 1869 by her ancestor Wilhelm Walch. The mild climate at 3,000 meters above sea level is responsible for the quality of the vines.
Südtirol ist ein Weinland. South Tyrol is a wine-growing land with perfect weather conditions. We have sun, but not as strong as in the south. So the grape has time to produce wonderful aromas. Elena Walch determines the ideal time to harvest the grapes, when the proportions of sugar, acid, color and aroma are well balanced. The sugar content of the grapes is monitored with a so-called refractometer. It mustn't be too sweet, but also not too sour. This time we had a wonderful year with Gewürztraminer at 14 degrees, that's around 22 Babo. I would say that's a great gradation. Gradation is the alcohol content. Elena had to learn the language of the trade. She taught herself how to make wine. She convinced her husband to allow her to take on a vineyard of the family estate. There she had the traditional Vernatch grape dug up and planted new varieties. I'm actually a qualified architect and studied architecture in Venice. And then I married into this family that has a long-standing tradition in winemaking. So for me, it was all new, but I was immediately enthusiastic. Elena Walch has remained faithful to the Gewürztraminer. It's one of the oldest grapes in Europe and is first mentioned in historical documents from the 11th century in the South Tyrolean village of Tameno. Today, the most important winemaking area is in Alsace. The Gewürztraminer is a grape that is very popular today because it has a very distinct tangy taste. It also has more subtle tastes of rose. The wine needs warm, sandy ground, preferably on a slope. Elena completely changed the way it was cultivated. Up until recently, the grapes were grown on a trellis in South Tyrol, but Elena employs the internationally acclaimed Guyot system, as is used in France or Germany. In the cellar you can't expect a miracle. It all comes from nature, from the vineyard. If you have prepared the vineyard well, then you can achieve good results. The high sugar content of the Tramina sometimes means that the fermentation process is not completed, leaving a remainder of natural sweetness. White wine ferments in small wooden barrels, barrique. For red wine, on the other hand, large oak barrels are used, and it's only transferred into the barrique to age. This is where the wine gets its woody taste. Only by regular tasting can Elena determine the right time for bottling. Some of the wines, like the Lagrain or Merlot, are stored for up to 20 months until they're bottled. And then they sit in the wine cellars of the buyers for several years before they're opened again. From Lake Carlton, the journey leads to the neighboring province of Trentino. The destination is Pinzolo. The river Sarka flows through an impassable region in the Brenta Mountains. In western Trentino, there are only a few villages. In 1967, 
Adamello Brenta became the first national park in Italy. Today, the 620 square kilometer national park is the largest protected area in the province. Near Pinsolo, the natural historian Filippo Zibordi is hot on the trail of an animal that's almost died out in the Alps, a brown bear. Coming across a bear is very, very rare, as the animals are spread out all over the place. And here there are probably around 30 in a very large area. They are particularly timid, and notice our presence before we notice them, as they have a particularly good sense of smell and hearing. That's why you need to be very lucky to see a bear. By releasing Slovenian bears into the wild, the National Park managed to increase the bear population. The Natural Park not only consists of the Brenta Dolomites, but also many forests and lakes, ideal conditions for the bears. One of them even made it into the Bavarian Alps in 2006. It's important to remember that bears had almost died out in the Alps and have only remained here. The coexistence of humans and bears is only possible in densely populated Trentino thanks to an intensive monitoring system. Monitoring the bears, finding out how many there are and where they are, is very difficult because you see them so rarely. That's why we go looking for their organic traces, fur in particular, which the bears lose on trees, but also in caves when they rub themselves. With the help of these traces, the natural historian can reconstruct the trail of the animals. Here he's found some fur, important for DNA samples that will be examined in the laboratory. Similar to forensic statistics, this allows Filippo to gain important information about the animal population, the number of females, and which animals are related. From November to March, the animals retreat to their caves. That's why Filippo only enters them in summer. During the other months, the danger of surprising a bear would be too great. In this cave, a bear has carried foliage inside as protection. Bears generally choose small caves to hibernate in. The larger caves aren't sheltered enough, and they're more exposed to the cold. It's an animal that has to be treated with respect and from which we should keep an appropriate distance. A distance which allows the bear to fulfill his needs. The same goes for us. These caves are very important places for preserving the species and must therefore be protected.
not far away, lies Lake Garda. On the way to Lake Garda lies the smaller Tenno Lake. Humans already settled here during the Bronze Age. The northern bank of Italy's largest lake is surrounded by 2,000 meter high peaks. Riva del Garda is one of the few towns by the lake still within the province of Trentino. The town formerly belonged to the Austro-Hungarian Empire and was ceded to Italy under the Treaty of Versailles. Until the end of the First World War, Riva was a fortress. Lake Garda was formed during the last ice age by glaciers. The first settlement on its shores dates back to 2000 BC. Today it's the touristic centre of the region. On Lake Garda, the mountains that have heated up during the day cool down at night. Then the vento stirs. In the early hours of the morning, it can reach a wind force of up to seven. Ideal conditions for kite surfers like Chiara Piccoli. I used to live in Verona and worked in an attorney's office. But three years ago, I decided to move to Lake Garda and work as a barkeeper in the summer. That way, at least I'm close to the water and the wind. I feel part of nature when I'm in the water and follow the wind. As long as I'm by the water, I'm happy. When she sets up, she must double-check her equipment, just like a parachutist. Chiara always goes where the best conditions are. Along Lake Garda, there are hardly any beaches from which to launch, but you can follow the wind by boat. Lake Garda is perfect for this sport because it's very windy. On some days the wind blows from the north, a wind locals call Peler, which comes from the mountains. It's a very strong wind. In the middle of the lake she can follow the wind better than on the ocean. It's easier and more enjoyable. Chiara uses every spare minute to go kite surfing. For the team from Michele's surfing school, she also takes part in competitions. Kite surfers ride on a board and are pulled across the water by a kite that harnesses the power of the wind. In the 19th century, an Englishman experimented for the first time with a large kite to propel carriages and small boats. 
According to the same principle, the fastest kite surfers can reach speeds of up to 100 kilometers per hour. You have to love nature if you kite surf. At least I think so, because you feel part of nature. You are carried by the wind and you are surrounded by beautiful countryside. That's my motivation. Not far away lies Switzerland, the next stop on the journey over the Alps. <laughs>